heavenly beings that were created. And as you remember, just in a reminder, when you see angel generally, that's either in both Old and New Testament, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, it's the word for messenger. And, and it indicates that they're usually coming, giving a message and things like that. So, um, but the other scriptures you'll see if you read in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 5 through 14, um, you get a picture of the living creatures around the throne. And if you read in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, again, you see the living creatures around the throne. And, and so I think when we look at all the different types of angels and the different descriptions, we come down to there's some, there, there has to be some synonymous overlap. You know, a lot of people, what's cherubim, what's this, what's that? I think there's overlap. And um, it's not that easy to finalize. And, and Isaiah, as I said, Isaiah is the only one that uses the seraphim. And I think he's doing it for a purpose because he talks about the, the, the poisonous serpent and the seraph. And he's showing that correlation. So now I want to talk about rank and order among angels. In other words, positions of authority and things like that. And you'll see, and actually both sides of the board are just a lot of questions like this. And um, so, so we want to work through that. The rank and order among angels, we, we know of at least one archangel. And we're going to look at those scriptures that are up in the right-hand corner. And so scripture does not indicate that there is some... It does indicate, excuse me, it does indicate to some extent that there's rank and order among angels. There are commanders and there are angels that have authority. And, and of course, the one archangel we know about is Michael. Uh, and, and so he's called an archangel. We see that in Jude, uh, well, we, chapter 1, verse 9. And, and um, I'll just read it for you. When the archangel Michael argued with the devil, they were arguing over the body of Moses. But Michael didn't dare to hand down a judgment against the devil. Instead, Michael said, may the Lord reprimand you. Now, we see that Jude seems to intimate there's some kind of authority in the title archangel. And the Greek word uh, also does that. It's archangelos. It's, so archangel is just a transliteration of archangel. And um, it would mean, lit if we literally translated Archangelos, it would mean um, chief messenger. Okay, Because Angelos means messenger, and Arch uh, in the Greek means chief. Or, and so we get Archangel as a chief angel, and there's that sense of authority. And, and so he, and he seems to have that when we see him appearing in different places in the Bible that Michael seems to have an authority and, and, and leadership w over some other angels. So in Daniel, Michael is called the chief of princes. And that's Daniel 10, 13. And it says, the commander of the Persian kingdom opposed me for 21 days, but then Michael... One of the chief commanders came to help me because I was left alone with the kings of Persia. So here's an angel that is coming to Daniel with a message. And he says, I, I meant to come as soon as you started praying. And, and when he describes the prince of Persia, this is a spiritual war. This isn't the actual prince of Persia. It's, it's, a, the, it's the demonic authority that's marshaled on behalf of sinful Persia is what he's describing. So when he says the prince of Persia, he's describing a demonic authority that is doing battle against him, trying to keep him from coming and, and giving a message to Daniel. And so with that, then Michael comes, who has more authority, and, and helps him with that process. And, and we can talk about that more when we get into Satan and his demons. Uh, but clearly there, you know, we see it in Scripture. And, and we don't want to forget that that hasn't stopped. That there are, there are demonic forces marshaled on, different, on behalf of sinful aspects of certain regions, right, geographically even. And so if you were to say, is there a prince of Toledo? Right? Is there a demonic authority 
that has marshaled himself here on behalf of sinful Toledo that keeps the ball rolling? I would say yes, absolutely. And that's why we need to be people of prayer. And, and so we see that picture, again, dealing with Michael, the archangel. Michael appears to be a leader in an angelic army in Revelation. So when we look at Revelation 12, verses 7 through 8, it says, Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels had to fight a war with the serpent. The serpent and its angels fought. But it was not strong enough, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, in the idea of the heavenly realm. Absolutely not. Uh, Michael's an archangel. We're going to talk about that in a little bit when we get to the fact that angels are created beings, and Jesus is a creator. So, um, but Michael is a fellow servant, just like humans, only obviously more powerful in different ways. So, we see here described a war. We, now, who's the serpent? Yeah, always we see that co coming up again and again, that um, the serpent refers to Satan. So, the serpent and his angels, what would that be? You know, we know that Scripture talks about, yeah, the fallen angels, a third of the angels sided with, with Lucifer. And, and so, there's that understanding <coughs> throughout Scripture that uh, Satan was originally uh, some sort of cherubim, uh, an angelic being himself, and apparently was quite beautiful, and, and uh, he wanted glory for himself and set out against the Lord, and a third of the angels followed him, and he was thrown down. And, and so we see that in fact, Revelation's kind of describing that there was war and there was no place found for him in heaven anymore. And he was cast down. And we'll, we'll develop that concept. Uh, you know, once we finish angels, we're actually going to deal with our doctrine of Satan and his demons. And, and so we'll be moving into that. So um, we see in this case, Michael as an archangel is a leader and authority over other angels. It's Michael and his angels. So he has uh, this army that he commands. Not independently of God's will, by the way, but subserviently to God's will. So I guess like a general or something. And then Paul tells us, these are things we know about archangels. Paul tells us that the Lord will return with the archangel's call. And that's in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. It says, The Lord will come from heaven with a command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. First, the dead who believed in Christ will come back to life. And then it says the rest of us will join in the next verse. So Scripture, incidentally... When you read that, here's what you have to know. Scripture doesn't tell us whether this is referring to Michael as the only archangel or whether there are others. And, and therefore, we do not know. So when he says the, with the call of the archangel, is he talking about Michael as the only archangel or are there other archangels the Bible never tells us about? The proper answer to that is, we do not know. And anything that you come up with beyond that is assumption, speculation, conjecture, guessing. And I'm sure there are people out there that could tell you this whole long thing about angels and everything. And, and my belief is simply this. If it's not in the Bible, we don't have the answer to that question. And, and we'd be foolish to manufacture answers. That's where false doctrine comes from. So that kind of sums up the archangel thing. The nearest we could assume, the only archangel we know about by name is Michael. We, there's even, in, even that scripture in Thessalonians when it says by the, the trumpet, uh, the voice of the archangel, that could still be Michael. We don't know. That's not me saying there's only one. That's me saying we don't know of any more than one. No. Yeah, so we're stuck. 
So that's a lot of help, isn't it? I think, I personally, you know, I think it's really good for human beings, Christian humans, to accept the fact that there are things they don't know. And, and it, because especially nowadays, it seems like so many Christians talk like they know everything. It's pretty good for us to come up to the point of saying, there are some things we don't know. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Yeah, there. Yeah. It does. Yeah, it is interesting. And, and, um, we're going to get to how, well, in orange there it says how many angels are there. And so we're going to get to that. But then um, we come to this next thing, names of specific angels. Hey, guess what? We know about two, Michael and Gabriel. Those are the only two names of angels given in the Bible. Now, you could say, well, well don't the others have names? I have no idea. If the Bible doesn't tell us, we don't know. Right? They probably do. That's a fine assumption, but it's still an assumption. You know, God could call them Angel 1, Angel 2, Angel Trillion, Angel Google, and keep it straight. So I, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I think it's it's safe enough assumption to say, well... We know that two of them have names, so the others probably do too. But um, let's just say that you shouldn't develop your doctrine or theology of angels from Christmas programs or television. So just throwing that out there. Even Christmas programs that occur here. So, you know, they're just cute kids' programs, they're not doctrine. We need to know the difference. So Michael, uh, we know his name, and we've already discussed the scriptures that discuss Michael and, and, sh and, and everything. So um, we don't have to go back over those. And the other one, of course, is Gabriel, who appears in scripture as a messenger. Now, some people often assume he's an archangel, but he only appears as a messenger. So, um, and, uh, you know... You, Apparently, he's enough. And so to Daniel, Gabriel shows up in Daniel 8, right? Verse 16, Daniel says, I heard a man in Uli Gate call loudly, Gabriel, explain the vision to this man. Gabriel came up beside me, and when he came, I was terrified and immediately knelt down. He said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision is about the end times. Now, there's an interesting thing in this verse we're going to want to talk about later. But just notice, when Daniel saw Gabriel, what was his reaction? He was terrified. So there's something about the appearance of Gabriel that's terrifying and miraculous. We have no idea. If he was a cherubim and we think any in the terms of the description of the cherubim, that's shocking right there. So we don't know. But it was something that shook, right, that shook Daniel and boiled his potatoes. And, and so, and we see in Daniel 9, verses 21 and 22, it says, While I was praying, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the first vision, came to me about the time of the evening sacrifice, he was exhausted. He informed me, Daniel, this time I have come to give you insight. Now, why was he exhausted? Spiritual war. Right? So, what do we learn from that? Angels get tired. Does God? Right? So, we're already beginning to see that angels are created beings, and that's important. Um, and then... Gabriel appears to Zechariah, right, who is a priest in the Holy of Holies. He's John the Baptist's dad. And so uh, in Luke 1, verses 18 and 19, Zechariah said to the angel, What proof is there for this? I am an old man, and my wife is beyond her childbearing years. Because he just prophesied to him that 
they would give birth to a son. And the angel answers him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. God sent me to tell you this good news. Now, this is the same Gabriel that terrified Daniel. Yeah. Well, but, but the, when he said, well, what proof is there that God's going to do this? The answer is, the proof is Gabriel is standing here. Who stands next to God. Didn't that, like, give you a clue, man? Yeah, like Gideon. <laughs> so, I mean, think that one through. Yeah, and he says, what proof is there? And he says, I'm Gabriel. I stand by the throne of God. I'm here. That's your proof. But since you didn't want to believe, you're not going to be able to speak, right? Because you used your mouth to doubt what God's doing. You're not going to get to use it till the child's born. It's an interesting thing, you know. So when the archangel says, Gabriel, you know, I just think it's funny. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And then Gabriel appears to Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Luke uh, 1, verse, starting with verse 26, it says, Six months after Elizabeth had become pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the city in Galilee. The angel went to a virgin promised in marriage to a descendant of David named Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. So, um, and she apparently didn't balk at his message quite the same as Zechariah. So, scripture doesn't tell me. So... Yeah, <laughs> that's probably our number one lesson tonight. If Scripture doesn't tell you, you probably don't know. Um, you know, I assume the Lord gave him her peace or, or something. You know, maybe she was, and the Scripture just doesn't tell us that part, right? So, um, you know, I will tell you if an angel appears to you, it's out of the norm. It should shake you up a little bit. Just by way of mentioning it. Yeah, but it still should rattle you. So, um, so you know, yeah, doubt can come. And so if you see that, then close your eyes and open them again. If it's still there, start asking God what he's doing. I lean on this one issue that... Um, the, to me, the, the testimonies that I take to the bank for theology are from Scripture. The others, uh, as they agree with Scripture, I'm like, yeah, see? That's what the Bible teaches. And so like with Gary's discussion, he's telling you sometimes angels appear as people and help you. And Hebrews tells us that actually can happen. So there's, there's agreement, and that's, that's good. Um, I'm hesitating on a story because you ask, would doubt be the first thing in someone's mind? And so I know a man that I trust very much um, who's extremely logical and scientific-minded. Uh, it'd be me. And, uh, and so when Charlie was a baby... Um, I woke up in the middle of the night. I don't often tell this story, but I woke up in the middle of the night, and there was an angel. And it wasn't very big. That's what was funny. You know, I always think, just little angel like this, sitting on the bed, rubbing her hair because she had fallen asleep on our bed with me. And, and Debbie was asleep on the other side, and this angel's just petting Charlie's hair, and I look at it, and it smiles, and... I close my eyes and I go, well, I'm dreaming, <laughs> right? I'm like, this is that's that's just me being groggy or having a dream or something, you know. So I start thinking about it. So I open my eyes again, and there it is, smiles at me, nods. <laughs> I close my eyes, go, no, no, can't be. And and I did that four times actually. I close my eyes each time saying, no, I'm seeing things. It's not real. Open my eyes. 
Smiles at me, nods, close my eyes. <laughs> Finally, after the fourth time, I open my eyes, there is, smiles at me, just rubbing Charlie's head, and I close my eyes and go, okay, it's an angel, and I fall back asleep. You know? So, yeah, doubt, I doubted, but I didn't contest any message or anything. I just logically worked through this thing to verify you know, is this just me seeing things? Is this just being groggy? Is it, you know how you do? And and I'm grateful. I, I, I don't know how else to put it. I, I think there have been times in our lives where the Lord has brought that to my memory as an encouragement, you know. Um, but I'm grateful I actually took that approach because it wasn't, oh, yeah, I didn't get all excited. I just went, and when I told Debbie the story, I said, so this happened, and I closed my eyes and thought it through and would open them and pause, you know, four times. I really spent time on it. It wasn't just, it was, I really closed my eyes and I think, now what could this be? And I'd process and open. So it was, a, it took a, 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 an amount of time to do. And I, you know, so that's my story. Um, and it wasn't like anything I'd ever read about wasn't like anything I'd ever heard anyone describe. You know, the only thing I can, you know, the thing that stuck out in my mind, you know, it was clothed in white, really bright, bright white, and had a gold belt, but the gold belt was almost white and clear. It was so pure. And, um, you know, no wings. Wasn't It wasn't terrifying in the sense of fear, but it was shocking because it's not something you see every day and at first I thought I was just seeing things and you know so yeah you know Captain Logic so um, so this shows us but that's something to, to, to notice now we come to this other thing angels are limited by space and time okay and we're going to see that but that's true because they are created. And and when we look at when they were created and things like that, we'll begin to think about the fact that when God started creating creation, he created space, time, and matter. He didn't need space or time. Space and matter and time have to exist simultaneously. And so we know that angels are limited by space and time. And we, we see that in the scriptures even. So scripture often shows angels as traveling from one place to another. They're not omnipresent like the Lord who can be everywhere. They, they travel. And so an example, Gabriel and Michael in the verses we discussed, right? They appear, they come and go at different times. So they're obligated to space and time. And, and Daniel 10, 12 through 14, we, we kind of see that. Uh, the angel is speaking. Daniel's talking about the angel. and says, he told me, don't be afraid, Daniel. God has heard everything that you said ever since the first day. You decided to humble yourself in front of your God so that you could learn to understand things. I have come in response to your prayer. The commander of the Persian kingdom opposed me for 21 days. But then Michael, one of the chief commanders, came to help me because I was left alone with the kings of Persia. I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the last days because the vision is about time still to come. So this is Gabriel. And so we see Gabriel and Michael, they come and they go. All right? And... And we see that throughout Scripture that angels come and go and they're not there always and so on and so forth. And they're obligated to time because they were created. They may not be obligated to matter in the same way we are because they're of a heavenly kingdom. But they seem to be obligated to space and time. They can't be everywhere all the time like the Lord. Um... So it shows us that angels are not like God, who is omnipresent. 
They are finite creatures, and so they're limited by space and time, not unlike us, right? And, and that's what we want to remember when we look at heavenly beings. Um, they, are, they are just beings. They're not God. And, and we think they're supernatural because they're not human. Right? But they, are, they have limited power. They only have what God gives them. So these are important things to grasp. And so uh, we deal with that. So we come to this other question, how many angels are there? And there's a few scriptures that give us an idea. And, and the first thing is the exact number the Bible doesn't tell us. So you know what that means. We don't know. But it does appear to be a great number. And, and we could say that, you know, we could even use the phrase innumerable. And what that means is innumerable by humans. There isn't an infinite number of angels because the only one who has infinites is God. Infiniteness. Um, but there, there's such a great number of them, we, we have no way of measuring it. It's beyond us. And so Deuteronomy 33, 2 says, He said, The Lord came from Sinai for his people. He rose from Seir like the sun. He appeared like sunshine from Mount Paran. He came with tens of thousands of holy ones on his right. It was a raging fire for them. And so the Lord came with tens of thousands. Right? That's a bunch. And then Psalm 68, 17 says, The chariots of God are 20,000 in number, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. The God of Sinai is in his holy place. So, again, they're saying just thousands and thousands. Hebrews uh, 12, 22 makes it even more explicit. It says, in, in God's word translation, it says, Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to ten thousands of angels joyfully gathered together. Now, the original Greek language uses this word murios, and it means myriad. And it, it hints more than one can count. So they might say tens of thousands. What they're saying is just a myriad, more than one can count. Myriad, yeah. And um, if that's not enough, in Revelation 5.11... And I saw and I heard a sound of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and their number was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Now, that doesn't bring glory to the angels. It brings glory to the one who created them. That worshiping around the throne of the Lord are myriads and myriads of heavenly beings that he created and empowers. And they bow before him in awe at his splendor. Now think that one through. That Gabriel appears and, and Daniel's terrified and Gabriel says to Zechariah, I'm Gabriel, isn't that a sign to you, right? And yet, Gabriel and all those other guys are around the throne awestruck by the glory of the Lord. So you would see an angel and be awestruck by an angel, perhaps. But they're awestruck by the Lord. Which kind of explains to us, you know, when, when um, the Lord says to Moses, you can't look at my face and live. What he's saying is you can't directly look at the full manifest presence and glory of God and survive it because you're but a man. And so, you know, every once in a while I'm Christian, I just want to see the face of God. Well, you're done on earth if you do. I just want you to know. Because if, if 
Gabriel can show up and terrify Daniel and, and angels can appear in the Bible and people are like dead and, and be shocked and want to bow down and all those things, then I'm pretty sure you'd just melt down with a heart attack and aneurysm and embolisms and whatever other isms you can have in reaction to the awe-inspiring glory of God. Which reminds us, this is a different topic, but it reminds us that what God has laid up for man in heaven is not available on earth. And there's a lot of songs and a lot of talk about how we want all that God has. You can have all that God has for you here. He is not going to break with his plans just because you want more. Just because a bunch of Christians get together and cry more, Lord, doesn't mean they're going to get it. It is. It sounds selfish because it is selfish. All right? And, and incidentally, you know, we're not the bride of, we're the bride of Christ. We're not the wife of Christ yet. There's this thing in the Bible called the marriage supper of the Lamb, which hasn't happened. Because in Revelation it says the bride has made herself ready. And after the rapture, the church is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's at that point we become the wife of Christ. And, you know, there are things in, in God's perspective that are only available to you when you're married. There's intimacy that's available in marriage that God doesn't want us to have outside of marriage. And he will never give his son to that kind of intimacy outside of wedlock. And Christians who think that they should have that level of intimacy that's available after the rapture are really not following scripture very well. So that's a little side note to think about. Um, okay, so do people have guardian angels? Well, let's look at the Bible, right? Let's see what we can learn from the Bible. We know from Scripture that God has sent angels to protect people. We do know that. We do know that they have as a ministry guardianship and protection at times. However, does that mean that that verifies the belief that each person has at least, or at least each Christian has, a guardian angel. Not necessarily. Now, the belief that there are guardian angels comes from Matthew 18.10. So I want to read that, and let's look at it to see if it actually confirms that we all do. Okay? And it simply says, it's speaking about causing small children to stumble, be careful not to despise these little ones. I can guarantee that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. That doesn't confirm that every individual has a guardian angel. It confirms that there are angels who have the responsibility of looking out for children. It doesn't confirm that adults have one. Okay. And incidentally, what we do see is that some of the angels that we recognize by name have been doing things in human history for thousands of years. Okay. And so what I can come from that is not that there are guardian angels. I can also, by the way, can't say there aren't. Right. Yeah. But that means angels 
function as guardians. It doesn't mean every person has a guardian angel, right? So what do we come back to? If the Bible doesn't tell us, we don't know. And people, people come up with these ideas, but it doesn't actually say that. And so those are things we should just consider. And I think there's a reason the Lord doesn't give us all that information because we have this tendency to worship things that shouldn't be worshipped. And we have this tendency to focus on things that maybe shouldn't be focused on. And, and so there's a balance there. And the, so, so we see that even, at, and, you know, I see that, you know, this passage, I see a lot of people saying, well, see, I have a guardian angel. Well, you're not a toddler. The, the Greek word for that little children is toddler. Right? Um, listen, do I think that God sends angels to help people? Absolutely. We're going to get to that. Do I think that means you have your personal angel? I don't see why you need to. Because as I understand it, they all belong to the Lord. So all that to say there's no concrete support of the whole guardian angel concept. All right. The angels serve God's purposes and plans, and if he wants to use them to help you, he will. It's kind of that simple. Um, we'll come to this other thing. Angels... There is a passage where um, Peter's knocking at the gate and they thought it was his angel. But that doesn't mean God thought it was. That means that's how they, in their mystic minds, were interpreting it. Right? And incidentally, we know it wasn't. It was actually Peter. Right? But God did send an angel to break him out of jail. So... Oh, then we come to this next thing. Angels do not marry, right? Do angels marry? Matthew twenty two thirty. We know that Jesus says they don't. Okay, so and it's it actually says this: when people come back to life, they don't marry; rather, they are like the angels in heaven. So by that, we understand angels don't marry, and incidentally, you won't be married. You said, you know, they don't marry or are given in marriage, right? Because they're asking that whole question. Seven brothers all married this same gal. Which when you get right down to it, I think they were just being nasty. Um, and, and incidentally, this of course is in the context of sexual encounters. Based on the way the Sadducees were asking the question. Because they said, well they all had her, whose wife is she? And he's saying, in heaven people aren't sexualized. That's not their deal. That may be the burden of earth, but it's not the burden of heaven. Now, it's hard for humans to think of not having a sexualized mind or sexualized body, but we'll be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And if you think what all of that has done for the human race, it might be nice to leave it behind. So... It also clarifies, by the way, this verse, something for you, that people do not become angels. It says they'll be like them, but they're, they don't become angels. You don't become an angel when you die. You don't get a wings when someone rings a bell. You're a spirit that either goes to judgment or reward because to be absent from the flesh is to be present with Christ. And we, we see Jesus giving the illustration, Lazarus goes to paradise and, and the rich man goes to Hades, right? So, in, and is suffering and torment in the spirit. They're not angels, Right. Um, because incidentally, there are enough angels. God doesn't need you to become one. He would have created you as one if that was the case. 
Humans don't have to die to make angels. Angels were made already. And so um, things to think about. How many, you know, how many TV shows, oh, they're an angel now. And I love it when people say, oh, that person's my angel. No, they're not. Ah, people. It's a shame we have to be one. Um, so what powers do angels have? Whatever the Lord gives them. There are scriptural passages uh, that, that give us the indication. They, they apparently have great power compared to human beings. You know, humans are made lower than the angels according to the scripture. Um, but they have limits as created beings. There are only certain things. If they were limitless in power, why did Michael have to come help Gabriel and so on and so forth? So there's something there. Um, they move in an entirely different realm, generally speaking, than we do. So it's a different power. Okay. So incidentally, while I'm on that topic, we'll cover it again when we get to demons. But um, people don't become ghosts when they die either. Yeah, because you either go to be with the Lord or you go to judgment, right? So you don't become a ghost, right? And so the ghost would be demonic presence stirring up trouble. And um, just off the, we're, we're at 8 o'clock, so we're kind of, I'll just cover that and then we'll stop about um, who is the angel of the Lord. We'll jump on that next week. Um, but you know, there's that passage where Saul, you know, Saul has chased all the witches out of Israel, and and he wants to talk to a medium, which is a person who talks with the dead, and he goes to the witch of Endor, and um, he says, "I want you to conjure up someone for me, right?" And she's going to conjure up Samuel. Now, here's the thing. This is a woman who is known for conjuring people up from the dead. But when Samuel actually starts coming, she's scared. She's shocked. Right? She didn't expect someone to actually come back from the dead. It's a whole new ball game all of a sudden. She's doing this, and God actually says, Samuel, you need to go have a chat with Saul. And Samuel shows up, and this medium is like, wait a second, this isn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Even though that's what's, what's theoretically supposed to happen, you know. So that should tell us something. <laughs> and, well, and here's the deal. You know what it tells me? You can't call up the dead. Nobody can call up the dead. Only Jesus could do that. These, these people that go out as palm readers and mediums and they're trying to do their seance stuff, if they communicate with anything, which I doubt most of the time, they're communicating with demo demonic forces. They're not reaching the dead because those dead are secured in the grave, in the hell, in Hades. They're being held over to the final judgment. Yeah, they're just hunting for demons, and I don't think you want to find one. And that's something to think about, that this, this medium who was supposed to be a person who calls up dead people was shocked when it actually took place. And, and so, you know, if, if demons could leave, if, if, if humans who died could leave hell, because hell, hell will be cast into the lake of fire at the end of judgment, the Bible says. If, if people who died could leave hell, then why did the rich man have to ask Father Abraham to send someone or to help him with his torment? Because he was trapped. 
And if people could leave heaven, why on earth would they? And, and so you can't do any of that. with Just because you die doesn't mean you're out from under the authority of God. So all this stuff is actually people dabbling in, in demonic things that they should be leaving alone. Which is why the Lord was so hard on pagan religions. Because the pagan religions dabbled in the demonic. In fact, there's a passage, I'll have to look it up for you, in Isaiah where it essentially says, I think it's in Isaiah, it could be in the Psalms. It might be in the Psalms. It says all, demon, all idols are demons. Which makes perfect sense if you've ever seen some of those hideous idols. So, uh, so let's close with a piece of trivia. You interested? Who does anyone here actually know what a gargoyle is? It's not. No. It's a French word for gargle, and it means downspout. And it's the sound that the water makes when it comes out the spout away from the wall of the building. Yeah, that's all it is. And so they, you say, but aren't they those ugly things? And Well, because the artisans will sometimes, a gargoyle is a monk, like the, the priest, it's a, and, a, and the water's shooting out its mouth. Sometimes it's a lion. Sometimes it's a bird. Sometimes it's those ugly-looking creatures. Um, and it, it could be any artistic rendering, and out of its mouth comes the water. And it's called gargoyle. And we get our word gargle from it. Because it makes that sound when the rainwater is shooting out of it. So, there we go. We, and, yeah. and yet we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we ask your blessing on our time and our fellowship and what we have learned and what we can know. In Jesus' name, amen.